Marcel's loss is a tragedy. Um, it gives, it's not a tragedy just in itself. It just gives out a very, very negative message to anyone who's willing to stay in Afghanistan, who has served in the previous republic. Uh, it just shows the Taliban as either incapable or unwilling to protect such people. And these people are the bridge between the previous system and the system uh, today, uh, Mursal was one of the few MPs that chose to stay in her country, make national TV appearances, and, and try to make a difference. Uh, and it's unfortunate. It's a great loss for the country. And uh, it just shows that the security situation in Afghanistan is deteriorating day by day. What do we know about her killing so far? Well, we don't really have a, a culprit or someone who's taken responsibility um, Currently, evidence points towards her uh, being killed as, as part of a, a, a petty crime, uh, a robbery at her place. Uh, it doesn't seem to be political, but then again, these MPs were targets uh, back during the Republic days, so they should have been given some sort of protection. There have been instances like this where high-profile people have either been assassinated or had attempted assassinations against them. Uh, and then the Taliban have claimed as to, like, why didn't these people maintain security? There is very little sense of a social contract where now the Taliban are responsible um, with the protection of these people. Uh, and they're currently failing to do so. Do you think investigations will help get to the bottom of this? Well, I mean, the Taliban aren't really acting as much of a government or an institutionalized government. If you've seen the recent policies, they've just been making life difficult for Afghan citizens, whether it's, and especially women, whether it's ban on high schools, on universities, or working at NGOs. And it just gives people this um, sense that this government or the, this regime isn't for them. So there's very little concern with the internal legitimacy or the winning over of the Afghan population right now. And I don't know if there are going to be any useful investigations into this or a way to stop these acts from occurring in the future. Abidullah, oh, since the Taliban takeover, what's happened to women's rights and freedoms in the country? Well, some have dubbed it, and rightly so, a gender apartheid, because at the end of the day, we are seeing a complete removal of women from the public sphere. We've seen them slowly being stripped of their rights and their existence and their voice. Uh, whether it was them having to cover their faces on national media, whether it was them being barred from public parks or gyms, or whether more fundamental things is going to school or universities or work. I had civil activists who had reached out to me after the school ban, and we were already campaigning against a possible university ban. And their question was, what will we do when they ban us from working? And I would tell them, OK, let's worry about that when we get there. And it just happened so quickly. The moment the university ban happens three days later, I am consoling them as they're sobbing because their lives have ended. Uh, how do you live? How do you move forward? Because at the end of the day, there are so many technical questions. Who's going to treat the woman if it is going to be a conservative society that will need doctors? If we're not producing any doctors, if we're not producing any civil act, civil service people that are women uh, and in a society where you will only let women ac uh, access your women, how is this society going to sustain itself? So currently there is a pushback from Afghans. They've, we've started a campaign of all or none uh, where the men are going to boycott everything that the women aren't allowed to participate in. Uh, it is yet to gain national momentum. But the hope is that the more pressure we pile on, the Taliban start seeing the utility of having women uh, take part in the public sphere. And it's, it's ironic that in the 21st century, we need to have that argument or need, we need to do that convincing, you know. Indeed. Well, it's been a few weeks now that there's been a ban on female workers at NGOs. What impact has that had on the humanitarian sector in Afghanistan? Well, we had up to, I think, 13 uh, major NGOs that were helping Afghans, NGOs that were helping up to a million, 700,000 Afghan women 
they all suspended their activities uh, because they truly thought they couldn't do their work if they didn't have any female employees to do the work through. Um, and then we've had uh, a delay in the $40 million that the UN flies into Afghanistan for humanitarian aid. Uh, we recently heard reports of Save the Children and IRC who have been allowed to access specific provinces with their female workers. So there is some progress happening on that end. But at the end of the day, once you have a ban in place, even if you're giving exemptions, you're creating that sense of fear amongst the female activists, female workers that are going into these areas. So it's not a supportive environment in a situation where Afghanistan is faced with the worst humanitarian crisis ever you could actually turn around and create in inducive uh, environments where more and more aid comes in but unfortunately the taliban are creating more hurdles than they're solving one last thing is we don't want just emergency aid because emergency aid just addresses the now we want to talk about development aid we want to talk about stabilizing our economy but the more the taliban rule out their policies it makes it impossible to have those kinds of conversations with donors so it's just been a slippery slope into hell and we're hoping that what we do and the stands we take actually make a difference abaydullah bahir uh, we have to leave it there but thank you so much for talking to us Thank you for having me.